So you put 10 or 12 years into something, you master your craft, and with really no hope of monetizing it in any way. Like if you go to college and you, you study to be a doctor, even if you're not the greatest doctor, you'll make a living. Same thing with an attorney or anything else, engineer, whatever it is you go to school for. Music is almost exclusively, or actually, no, I won't say that. Arts in general are almost exclusively the only thing you could put a massive amount of effort in, become exceptional at it, and still make no money and make no living and have to work at a gas station or something. Which is exactly why I do this show. <laughs> Because I really want to help the audience find patterns in what successful people do to achieve their dreams. Because like you said, you know, if you want to be a doctor, you know where to go there's to school. Role. Yeah, and right. there's no blueprint for the there's, entertainment industry. But there really isn't a possibility of creating a blueprint. Mm -hmm. The problem is you could be incredibly talented and get in the wrong band and go nowhere. I'm totally. just going to talk about Um, being in a band right now because that's what I know mm -hmm. the most, right? So from the perspective of somebody that's been in multiple bands but only one that could draw a crowd and was successful, it's not enough to have the talent. It's not enough to have the drive. It's not enough to get with the right band. Everything has to go right in order to be successful. And then you, you almost do it in spite of the people in your band sometimes, which is kind of explained system of a downs road where we've become more and more successful in spite of our best efforts to ruin it. You know, so What do you mean by that? Elaborate. Well, we haven't made an album since 2005. We barely tour. We don't do interviews. We don't do press. We're almost com completely sundered from the music business. And yet, we have more and more offers to play every year. Does that make any sense to me? So when Artsakh was attacked, you got together and you made two new songs for the first time in 15 years, mm -hmm. right? Yes. So we talked about this a little bit last time. By the way, let's talk about last time. You're going to use some of that footage. Mm -hmm. You should never get me after poker night, number one. <laughs> Wait, I'm grumpy the whole day, the next six, I'm lose? tired. No, I won, but and I was you're tired. you're still grumpy. I'm up till three in the morning, then I get up at six. Plus, like around 3.30 to four o'clock is my nap time, you know, so... <laughs> Why does that sound terrible? Well, I'm just telling you, like, my, there's, there's multiple personalities, right? Like some people, they, they live their best life if they get up early and they're good the whole day and then they go to sleep at a normal hour. There's other people that are almost nocturnal by nature, right? And I, actually, I was actually reading something about this that said without those nocturnal people, the human race probably wouldn't exist <laughs> because they were awake. Yeah when attacks could potentially happen when everybody else was asleep, right? So like if a wolf was going to come attack or something like that. I don't know how true that is. But, um, <laughs> and then there's people like me. I like to get up very early. I like to be extremely productive, mostly early on in the day. Then I like to rest, I like take a nap, maybe just not even do anything, lay in bed and just think. And then I can be productive later. You caught me in the least productive time of the day. <laughs> And you made me drive all the way to the West Valley, you know, which was fine, but it took a long time. So, so you were a little grumpy is what you were saying. I was pretty grumpy. So you should use some of it to show mm -hmm. like the difference. I'm not so grumpy today, especially since I'm looking forward to pizza coming. You know, it makes uh -huh. me very happy. Can I just uh, add to that, that after that interview, you were like, see, I'm not filtered. I just speak the truth. I don't filter anything. And then well, afterward, as... he's like, an hour later, he's like, um, do, you think, <laughs> do you think I could take some But of that But I'm just out? as unfiltered now. Yeah. It's just not coming off as I'm bitter. It's just coming from a positive and yeah. not hungry place. Like the, I feel the same way about everything, pretty much. Yeah. I'm just not bitter about it today because I'm not tired. Got it. I think I've gotten myself into enough trouble. Uh, you're satisfied by the level of trouble? I think it's pretty good, yeah. How do you feel about the rock scene today? I don't really know much about the rock scene th these days. You know, I've been out of the loop for so long, especially since System hasn't really made a record, aside from the two songs we did recently, that we really haven't been immersed in what trends are happening, how the scene is developing, what bands are coming out. You know, like most people, I listen to what I like listening to and occasionally find new music through friends and stuff like that. But You know, I'm still listening to pretty much the same stuff I listened to for the last 40 years. What do you like listening to? What's on your playlist? I don't really have a playlist, but I mean, it's really all over the place. I know a lot of people have that answer, but it really is. But 
lately I've been getting into a lot of pop stuff, believe it or not. Like Like, uh, like Sia. Oh, really? I'm a big Sia fan. Oh, okay. I was yeah. actually going to ask you, who is someone that you listen to that your fans would probably be most shocked by? Sia would probably Sia. be one. Pink would probably be another. Oh, really? I Pink just, actually has some really cool rock stuff. She does. I just really admire her voice. Mm -hmm. You know, the clarity of it, yeah. the notes she hits. It's very difficult. Yeah. You know, so I don't know. I, and I think she's pretty cool. I met her a couple of times. Yeah. And she was always nice. Mm. But um, aside from that, I just listen to the same probably 30 or 40 bands that most people listen to over and over again. Yeah. Well, so Led you, Zeppelin, The Beatles, you know, The Who, course, Rush. The classics. Yeah. You actually get to meet a lot of the people that you listen to. Has there been anyone who's either surprised you in a really good way or put you off? Like, are you the type where if you meet someone and you don't like them, you can't listen to their music anymore? No, I can separate. You can from, separate it? Yeah. I can separate pretty easily from the artists and their art. Yeah. It, you kind of have to do that, you know, otherwise something will turn you off or you'll expect something from somebody and they're never going to meet your expectations because that's not what their purpose in life is, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So you just put all that stuff aside and enjoy their art or don't. It's so true and Misha's like that too, but if I don't like them, like in a really big way, I can't separate it. Like I hear it in the voice or I hear it, I just end up hearing it in the music. So it's so good. So probably best for you not to meet anybody. You know, because you know what? most yes. people are going to let you down in life. You know, again, you have this vision of who they are, right? Based on really no knowledge of them. You're just listening to music that they created with other people, generally speaking, or art that they created on their own. And you're judging them based on that. But you really can't because people don't even know you from interviews that you do. Although parts of your personality of do course. come out, they're not going to yeah. know the true you. You know, so... For them to judge you is unfair, and for you to judge others is unfair. Yeah, it's and also, very true. And also, you're only going to do yourself a disservice, because you may not yeah. want to listen to stuff that you enjoyed listening to before. I don't know how much of it is on an intellectual level and how much of it is on an emotional level. When I met Ringo Starr, I ended up becoming an even bigger fan of the Beatles because, I mean, he's one of the most successful musicians of all time. And he was so down to earth. He was so interesting. He was so forthcoming. And then you're just like, wow, you know, this But is... But what if he wasn't? Yeah. What then... if he wasn't that day? What if it was a completely negative experience for you? Would that detract from your love of the Beatles? Or his contribution to the Beatles. Okay, but like if someone was a total douche to you, you would really be able to separate it completely? No one's a total douche to me. I mean, I'm sure it's happened. It's never happened. Never happened. No, no one? Okay. I've had really good experiences. And that might be unique. Well, I will tell you, I guess that's not true. Someone has been a douche to me. <laughs> I was a big Three's Do Company tell. fan when mm -hmm. I was a kid. You probably don't know what that is. No. Okay, so it was a... It was a sitcom that was mm -hmm. on like once a week. I used to watch it with my family. And there was an old man on that show. And I loved his personality, his snarkiness, all that. And as an eight-year-old kid, I was at the airport and he happened to be there. And I went up to him and I said, excuse me, can I have your autograph? And thinking back, it's kind of a fun experience for me. He looked down at me and said, not now, kid, and then walked away. Now... I don't know why I was shocked by this because that's the exact same personality he had on the show, right? So I should have been like, perfect. That's ex the experience I should have had. But it kind of affected me negatively because, you know, here's this person that I really enjoyed watching and uh, he was not very Do nice to a little kid. A I'm, a little, I'm a little kid. Now, you take that into my life and my experiences. I've done the best I can to be nice to people even if I had just gotten into a fight with my girlfriend or something negative had happened. I don't think I've been perfect over the last, the course of the last 22 to 25 years, but I've done the best I can to treat people well. But again, I don't spend my time thinking about that. I just try to be who I am. But you really shouldn't, as, as somebody that is meeting people, judge them based on a single, single time and It's experience true. in your life. You're right. Because you will be the loser in that situation. You're right. Unless you write negative things about me online, which <laughs> I'm used to at this point. What's the difference? Oh, we'll get to that. Mm -hmm. We'll get to that because that's an interesting topic, actually. Okay, so let's talk about those. <laughs> let's talk about those two songs. Those two songs that you created after 15 years of not making music together as System of a Down. How did that come about? The anger 
and helplessness that I felt during that period is not something that I could easily define or explain. And I was laying in bed with my wife. We were watching uh, TV, and I was on I was on social media, just looking at pictures of what was going on and feeling like I wanted to do something about it, but not knowing what that thing was. And then I remembered that I'm in system of a down, you know, and we have a pretty good reach. So I said to my wife, I said, I'm going to send a text to the guys. So I sent the guys a text and I said, irrespective of how we feel about each other, irrespective of who is upset about what or what drama there is or whatever else. This is something that we should put to the side during this time and come together and try to do something for our people. And everybody reacted very positively. And I think that sometimes you need something that's bigger than your ego or your whatever particular bitterness or anger or enmity you have and just put it aside and come together and, and just realize that you can do something positive instead of just doing nothing. And that's what we did. So what is the process like of creating the songs? Well, both of those songs were, uh, Darren had written both of those songs. One of them he had written for Scars on Broadway, which is Protect the Land. Mm -hmm. And the other one we had actually worked on together for a potential System of a Down album like what five years ago or something like that when we were having con conversations with the band and with uh serge me shavo and darren sitting in a room saying are we gonna make an album or what's gonna happen and uh, at the time unfortunately we couldn't make it work um it wasn't because of lack of effort it's just you have to have an agreement right you have to say okay we're gonna move forward and this is how it's gonna be we couldn't come to that um, understanding um, between the four of us so we didn't do it so one of those songs was from that session, and we ended up repurposing it for this, changing some lyrics and uh, making it work for the cause, basically. So besides the fact that it was for such an important cause, how did it feel after all that time to have two new songs released for your fans and to get their feedback? What was that like? Well, there's positives and negatives of it because the road of getting somewhere is also important. Right, like how you achieve something is part of the process. So that wasn't the greatest for me, you know, but at the end of the day, because it wasn't for me, you know, it was something that I'll never make a dollar off those songs. I've given my lifetime publishing for those songs, any royalties, it all goes to our meeting causes. You know, so it was never about the financials for me. So in, in that way, it was incredibly successful for me, personally. And although it was nice to have something come out, that also reminds you of the potential because obviously we still have something to give to the world, you know, and when you put something out that actually makes an impact, you're like, well, why aren't we just doing this all the time? And then I go down the rabbit hole of like uh, frustration and anger that, you know, I'm a sensitive person, so I can't just hold this stuff in. It has to come out one way or the other. And, um, and it takes me a long time to deal with it and to cope with it because I also am realistic in that life is finite. You know, you, you only have a certain amount of time and here we are, we're, we have this gift, right? That came from God or wherever, you know, whatever. And we're squandering it. We're literally, we're, it's an insult. It's an insult to everybody else that tries to make it in whatever endeavor they're trying to make. And here we are, we've made it. We have the talent, we have the ability. We have an adoring fan base. You know, we've sold, I don't know, whatever it is, 30 million albums or more. And they're hungry for it, and we just don't do it. That's like the worst, right? Like having the ability to do something and not doing it is, I think, the worst thing in the world as far as in the perspective of being an artist. I mean, you're just hurting yourself. Do you see a path forward where you think just to yourself that if only we could adjust this this way, it could work? Like, can you imagine a way forward or does it feel impossible to you? Yeah, if my band members listen to me and put everything <laughs> to the side and just said, okay, let's just go in and make the best album we can make and not care about where the music comes from or who wrote the lyrics or, you know, what this person did in the past. I'm willing to put all that aside. 
I just don't, I'm not in the band that'll do that, unfortunately. I just thought of something stupid, but you know how there's marriage therapy? Is there such a thing as band therapy? Yeah, Metallica did it. No way. Yeah. Oh, I thought I just came and, up with it. And it helped them. I think it was like 2003 or four. they, they went in. They had some serious yeah. problems. And that's another thing. I see all these other bands. They, people die, you know, you know, they're strung out for years. They make it work. We were supposed to do part two of this after you played a concert. And that concert was supposed to be very soon after part one. But then mm. it kept getting pushed back because of COVID. And then finally it was going to happen. And we were so excited to come. And then Serge got COVID. And then it got pushed back again. Finally, the concert happened. We had so much fun. It was such an amazing show. It was. It's interesting because I was a fan before I became friends with you guys. And for me, it was such a big deal to meet Serge for the first time uh, when I was 14 years old. Because when I was in high school, nobody knew anything about Armenians. When they would ask me, so where are you from? And I would say Armenian. They would say, uh, oh, Romanian. Or they would mix yeah, this it up was with before something the Kardashians else. Came out. You guys put Armenia on the map way before the Kardashians came around. Kardashians well, we did were our not part. around. We did our part. No, but you did. And in high school, it was like the coolest thing ever to say you're Armenian at one point because they're like, oh, like system of a down guys. And it was always a conversation that came up. So when I was in the audience seeing you guys, I, I saw you guys for the first time when you opened up for Black Sabbath. In 1998. Oh, yeah. That Pantera was on that show, too. Yes. And my parents had brought me to that concert. They would always take form. me to concert. Was it at the Forum? It was at the Forum. It was at the Forum because I still have the ticket. So I came to the concert and it was so funny because you guys came on. And then at one point we saw the Armenian flag and we thought it certainly must be a mistake. It must be the Colombian flag. Upside and they down, just had yeah. it upside down <laughs> yeah. or something. It couldn't have been real. And I think I realized at one point that, no, this could be the real deal because we started picking up on Armenian elements in the music and it was just so different it was so cool so now as a friend to actually be invited to the show to come and to see you guys play and I'm like okay these are guys that I know who are all really just cool personalities cool guys great people um, and then you see thousands of people in the crowd who are just all entranced by your music and you just really go okay the, is there a certain point where as a band you feel like it's almost bigger than yourselves even for everything that you've been able to do for Armenia because other Armenian celebrities they'll share one post or they'll share two posts and then it you know they're just on with the rest of their lives when Artsakh was being attacked you guys worked tirelessly to get the word out I mean I saw Serge lost weight at some point and I was really concerned for him because he was just morning to night working on doing interview after well, interview his back was also hurting at the same point yeah so he was in a bad situation he had to have surgery on his back yeah, at a certain point it's still not good you know so that's that's been a big problem for him but yeah I mean you you want to live your life right you want to enjoy yourself we have two children we have positive things happening all the time and then you know halfway across the world your people are suffering you feel guilty you don't want to have anything that you have you know like you, I, at least this is how i felt you know i felt like why do i have a house i could sell my house i could send the money to to aid my people and maybe buy weapons or something. You know, why do I have a car? You know, why do I have this? Why do I have that? These things are, are inconsequential. My people are dying. But you guys also had something that a lot of people don't have, which is a voice. Because but I, we already did that, right? But it was like, well, what more can I do? You know, and um, it, it's just so much frustration. And like, like I said earlier, it's that helplessness. You can't do anything about it. If I was there, maybe I could pick up a weapon. Yeah, I'm 50 years old. I could pick up a weapon. Maybe I could take a few of them out before I die. That's what I was thinking. I was like, let me get on a plane and go over there. She wouldn't let me go. My parents wouldn't let me go. But I remember in, in the early 90s when the first war happened, and I was actually contemplating joining the Marine Corps here in the United States at the time because I always respected the military, you know? And uh, my grandfather sat me down and he goes, if you're going to join the military, why don't you go join the one fighting for your homeland? I didn't even know what was going on. I was a kid. I didn't even know what Artsakh was. You know, I knew Armenia, obviously. And I knew where I was born and I knew about the genocide and all these things. But I just wasn't armed with the information. 
And you know, I, I regret not going and fighting for my people because I could have done it when I was 18. You know, if I didn't have a family, I would have done it the last time too, whether they wanted me or not. Mm. I just feel like there's never enough you can do. There's never enough you can do, but being in a special position where you have a voice, where a lot of other people don't, Armenians complained a lot about not getting news coverage, just basic news coverage about being attacked. And you guys were able to reach millions of people that wouldn't have known about it if you guys didn't exist. So it Mike makes me, It makes me very angry. And I feel bad for the Ukrainian people. Trust me. You know, I have a lot of empathy. Governments are what cause these strifes, and ultimately, it's about money. You know, whether people realize it or not, everything is about resources and money. Russia wants Crimea and that part of the of the sea because there's a massive, like one of the one of the largest um, natural gas reserves in the world. They're like I think 14th or 15th largest. Plus, there was a plan to start drilling there and undercutting Russian natural gas. Now, Russia's number one export is natural gas and oil. That's their entire economy. You know, so um, there's a cause and effect to everything. But, you know, I'm watching every single thing I go on, Ukraine banners, Ukraine flag. Where was this attention for us? You know, what did we do that, that we're looked at as, as insignificant? And how do we change that, more importantly? We cannot feel sorry for ourselves. That's not going to get us anywhere. So Until we, we make ourselves, that? we have to make ourselves a power. And we have to do it with our brains. We don't have enough people to make a difference. We're, we're fighting against 100 million people between Turkey and Azerbaijan. We have no chance, okay? Unless we can figure out a way to get them with technology, we're screwed. So that's what we should be hyper-focused on, and we should be having a lot of kids. Every time we lose somebody, it's not just that person that we lose. We lose the generations that they could have sired. You know, so we have to do our part as Armenians. You know, there's millions of Armenians across the world. Maybe, maybe we can slowly start to figure out a way to invest in Armenia, put resources there, and, and develop a, a good technology base. I know it's already being done, but... We can we can make it a much faster process, you know. That's the way we do it, you know. Um, we have to make ourselves important, so that people give a shit. We don't have anything. We haven't discovered something in the ground that makes us important. We have to use our brains. How do you feel about the political crisis in Armenia right now? It's embarrassing. It's saddening. It's maddening. I can't say that. I have the perspective of, of an Armenian living in Armenia, but as somebody from the diaspora, I feel like I've been sundered from my homeland my whole life and the life of my parents as well, because they were born in Lebanon, just like I was. So my dream is to see Armenia strong and growing and prosperous and free to live our lives without threat of attack from our neighbors. You know? But, you know, um, I mean, I don't know. I, I was supportive of... Pashinyan, when he came into office, I like some of his ideas. Of course, I'm not quite in line with some of the woke stuff. And, you know, we have a lot of big problems to solve in Armenia that we should be concentrating on. And, and, I, and I felt like that, that should have been the focus. And, you know, obviously strengthening ourselves militarily was very important. And I think that it wasn't just Pashinyan, but former people in power also did a pretty good job of selling us out in a lot of ways, you know? And I'm not really sure what's going on with Pashinyan because there's so many reports coming in. I can't make heads or tails of it, you know? But what I want going forward, whoever's going to lead the country, maybe they can think of the country, strengthening it so that Artsakh can also have, you know, Garabal and Artsakh can have our strength added to it and, um, you know, help prevent continued conflict because nobody attacks somebody that they deem to be very strong. They will only attack people that they deem to be very weak. And for whatever reason, Pashinyan is seen to be weak. That's the perception. So our enemies are taking this chance to attack us from every which way they can. What do you think makes a good drummer? 
Well, there's a lot of different philosophies when it concerns being good at something. You know, I've always found that for me, it's my ability to look at music differently than anybody else. Right? Like, so if you bring me a song, I will think of parts for that song differently than most people do. That's what makes me a good drummer. There's other good drummers that technique wise blow me away and, you know, they're incredible soloists and all that stuff. Probably could have done that too if I put in the effort, but uh, I just didn't do it. So, you know, um, in that way I rested on my laurels, so to speak. You know what stayed with me uh, when we were talking last time that you said was when you joined System of a Down, you played a little bit faster than the previous drummer did, and it gave the music a little bit of an uncomfortable but good feeling. Yeah, almost a, an anxiety. Whenever I have an upcoming guest on the show, I post that that guest's coming on, and I allow the fans to ask some questions. So then Dave Hokopian messaged me yesterday when he found out that you're coming on. What negative things did he have to say to him? He made me promise not to tell. <laughs> But so for those of you who don't know, Dave Agopian and I were in a band together long before System. He was in a band with the guys in System before he was in my band, and we've known each other since high school. So we've had a long, great relationship. Uh, that was actually news to me that you guys played so much musical chairs with without the knowing bands. it, though. Without knowing it, like I, we just put an ad out in the paper at that time. That's what you did to find a bass player because our bass player wasn't working out, and he applied. And, uh, and I was like, oh, Dave, hey, how you doing, you know? We knew each other from the gym, we knew each other from high school. And um, obviously he's a fantastic bass player. He was back then, he's been better now, but it worked out so for a little he, while. He said that he took you to your first System of a Down show? He may have, I don't remember. Um, I didn't go to a lot of shows back then either. Do you remember your first impression of System of a Down before you were in the band? I don't think I liked them very much. Why I, not? Well, I was more into like progressive rock at that time, you know, and the, my style fit more progressive rock. They were kind of loud, um, aggressive, a little more aggressive than I was used to. I liked the melodies. They weren't as mel melodic as they are, as we, well, we weren't as <laughs> melodic back then as we are now, you know, but you could kind of get an inkling of where it was going to go. You know, but I was listening to stuff like Iron Maiden, which was hyper melodic, Metallica, which had a lot of melody at the time. So the heavy music that I listened to had much more of a melodic sense to it. And System just wasn't that. And I'm not sure I grasped it right away, which I think is the experience for a lot of people when they first hear System. You know, there's a lot to take in. And as we grew and expanded, it became even more of a difficulty to fully comprehend the band. So what was the turning point for you where you actually felt that you wanted to be a part of the band and... Oh, I never wanted to be music? a part of the band, initially. So, so how did it happen? Well, that's a long, that could be this entire interview. You want to really get into... Let's get into it. I mean, it's a long story. Well, I'll, I'll give you the abridged version. So eventually we became friends and we shared studio space because we were all broke. You know, none of us had money. We were scraping by like 100, 150 bucks a month to pay for studio rent between two bands. And more often than not, the door was locked for us when we went to practice because system didn't pay their half, you know? Um, and then through time, you become friends with people. And we did, you know, we had a good relationship. We would go hang out, have a beer together occasionally, and really just talk about music, talk about what our dreams were, our aspirations were. And I slowly developed closer and closer ties to the guys. They slowly had more and more issues with their drummer, who was a fantastic drummer, Andy. I'm sure you're familiar with him. Mm -hmm. And a great artist in his own right, you know. Um, and also played with Dave. Like, all the pieces come together again. And um, it became clear that they were no longer going to be compatible, you know. But when you're in those situations, it's very much like having a friend and they have a girlfriend that you admire, and you're, in, you know, more often than not, you say, okay, well, I would like to date someone like that person, you know? But this became a situation where the other three members, although they didn't know it, had all approached me within a one-year period and asked me that if Andy was no longer in the band, would I join the band? I was very committed to my band, although we didn't have a singer and didn't have one for over a year, you know? 
but I still felt a lot of loyalty. Mm. And we built something that I was proud of. You know, I really liked our music back then. And I was, uh, I was loath to take someone else's position, you know, especially Andy, who I liked, and who I admired as a musician and as a person. So um, I told him no, I declined. You know, so it was never my intention to join system. But like all things that are meant to be, circumstances lead you to the position that you're supposed to be in. And then the decision is no longer yours. You know, so that's kind of what happened. Andy got into an argument with somebody, somebody's boyfriend or something. You know, he was having his own issues. So I won't get into it, but um, that led to him getting arrested. You know, there was a, it's a long story, but anyway, suffice it to say a month later, I was supposed to appear in court with Andy and I was waiting in the morning to be picked up. And I got the bad news that he broke his hand punching a wall. So this is also simultaneously happening when System is being courted for a record deal. Mm -hmm. You know, so it was a, it was a difficult time for this to happen. And um, I was entrusted with the job of letting the guys know that, hey, your drummer broke his arm or her hand or whatever it was. So back then we didn't have cell phones. So I paged the Shavo, you know, 911. And he called me back. He was with Darren at the time somewhere. And I said, bro, I hope you're sitting down. I have some bad news for you. And he's like, oh, you know, if you know Shavo, you know, <laughs> Like this pretty much describes his reaction, right? Like, what, what, what's going on? And I said, Andy broke his hand. And then um, I heard Shavo repeat what I had told him. And then I heard kind of sadistic kind of laughter in the background a little bit, right? And then Darren yell, ask John if he'll join the band. You know, so I was like, okay, that's not the reaction I expected, but all right. And then, um, The next day we, we got together, we had a meeting, the four of us, and they said, look, we, there's a worse time in the world. Andy's going to be out for six months. You know, his arm was like this for like four at least. And um, we have all this attention from the labels. We can't stop now. You, you know the songs. You're in the studio half the time when we're rehearsing. You got to cover for Andy. And that was what I thought it would be initially, is that I would go in and I would cover. And then when Andy was better... You come back, and I go back to my band, you know? So I basically, mm. rehearsing with System, I told you it was a long story. I was basically rehearsing with System and my band, whatever we were called at that time. We had like five names at the same time. So, you know, um, a lot of work for me. And then um, a couple of days in, it was just so obvious that it was meant to be. I played a little bit faster than Andy. I've always been ahead of the beat a little slightly, you know, which gives kind of a, an uncomfortable but good feeling to the music. And it just worked, and it was undeniable. And even my guitar player, after watching our second rehearsal, said, you know, he just kind of went like this and walked out of the room, you know? Because he knew. Yeah. So then it was the next uncomfortable conversation of the guys saying, look, we don't, we think this is the right for piece for this band. We, this is what we want to move forward with. And we love you, and we get along with you. We just don't get along with Andy, you know? A couple of the members just, they couldn't make it work with him. And um, he would have eventually been thrown out of the band, in my opinion, you know? And I'm not saying that's an excuse of why I decided to join. I had a very hard time with that decision. It took me something like five days mm -hmm. to finally come to the decision. But in the, in the end, as much guilt as I had, I knew it was the right thing to do. So that's pretty much the story of how I joined the band. So I never really, technically, I never really joined the band. I yeah. really started focusing on that after, like now when I listen to System, I pay attention to that. And I'm like, yeah, that is what gives you that feeling. Is that something you did intuitively or is that a drumming technique? Like, how, how did you decide to do that? I think it really is just my nature. Mm. I jump the gun a lot. You know, I don't really, I don't tend to think things through very well. You know, because I am super emotional and um, reactive, right? So my drumming reflects that. You know, two weeks ago, we went to see Metallica in Vegas, my wife and I and two friends. And there was somebody that cut us off and was just being a complete jerk to my friend who was driving. And my first instinct was to get out of the car and, and go confront the person. <laughs> 
you know, now that doesn't mean that I went to go beat him up, but I didn't think it through, right? I didn't think like this could lead to an altercation or you can get arrested or the guy can pull out a gun and kill you. Mm. I didn't think of these things. I just reacted. And that's kind of like how I play drums. I'm, when I'm playing, okay, there's a, there's a movie called Ben-Hur, the Charlton Heston one, not that shitty one they did a couple of years back, the Charlton Heston version. And at some point he's talking to a sheik and they're talking about these chariot races, right? So the sheik is proudly showing off his horses. He's, he's talking about the first horse, and he's like, this one is the one that like, wants to win the race in the first 10 seconds of the race. You know, like puts everything into it. And then he was going through the different personalities of the other three horses. I'm the first horse. I want to win the race now. I don't want to think about a year from now, two years from now. I want to win it now. But that doesn't mean I'm not long-sighted, because I do things... Also thinking of like generational stuff, right? I think of my kids' kids, how I'm going to set them up. I think of like, what are we going to do three generations from now as far as what we're doing in this country? What are we doing in Armenia? I think of that stuff when I can be more contemplative. But for initial reaction, I'd probably be the first person killed in a battle, you know, because I wouldn't be looking for the safe place to attack from. I would just go in and try to kill as many people as possible. It's just my personality and my drumming reflects it. So when you were growing up and you were playing in different bands, did you have in mind that you want to join a band that has the potential to get signed? Was that even in, in your mind? Oh, I always thought I was going to get signed. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. I just thought it was going to happen when I was like 18. I didn't think it was going to take till 25. I was quite depressed. I was like, I'm still not signed? I was listening to bands on the radio and I'm like, they suck. That drummer's horrible. Why am I not signed? That's what I used to think. So who do you feel like in the band, in System of a Down, was the most business-oriented to um, actually make the appropriate steps to have the chance to get signed? I just don't think it was thought of that way. Hmm. I think we, well, before I was in the band, they already had a really good thing going. They put together the right people, and I was that, like, missing piece. And when I got plugged in, it just, everything started to really happen in a quick way. You know, when you say they had the right people, do you mean management and agents it's, and things like that? Or? All of that is important too, right? But if you don't have the ingredients for the soup, you can't make the soup. They can't sell the soup if you don't have a soup. So we're the soup. And it's the different flavors that make it exceptional. And then somebody else can help you monetize it, sell it, you know, exploit it, whatever the case may be. So you had the perfect storm. Now... Shavo is not the greatest bass player in the world. I'm not the greatest drummer in the world. Darren Malakin is not the best solo guitarist in the world. And Serge is not the best singer in the world. You know, but when you take the, the four of us and you put us in System of a Down, something else happens because those four elements merge with each other and create something completely different. And that's why we're as successful as we are. Did and that's why if you look at our solo projects, they're not as, as successful. Did you guys realize at the time that you're onto something special? You do and you don't. I've always thought we were the best band in the world. So, was that you or me? That was me. I think I'm a little that hungry. You, well, the pizza's here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's so funny. You don't know if it's you or somebody else. Uh, Is that the weirdest thing? I, I definitely knew it's me. Okay. okay. You want to ask that again? Um, Although if we keep that in there, it'd be really funny. But, yeah, I know you're not yeah we could keep it. I know in. you're not going to, but it's okay. No, I'm. I'm I actually, the, I like the real stuff too. All right, well, that was a little, maybe a little too. If you fart, it might be a little too real. You know? <laughs> okay. There's a point where it's too real. Okay, just in case, I'll ask again so that if it's too real, we'll cut it out. Um, <laughs> uh, you can pretend it was me. <laughs> I could. I'm like, I could. oh, sorry. Um, so. When you guys were playing as System of a Down, and there were all of these other bands around, there was really an explosive rock scene, actually, at the time. Did you realize that you were onto something special? <laughs> it was hard not to think that we were special, but not special. I just felt like we were better than any other band on the planet, no matter who they were. And... I, it, my opinion is you always have to have that philosophy on the inside. Mm -hmm. now, you don't go saying that because it, sound, it makes you sound like an egotistical ass, right? 
But if you don't feel like you're the best, and if you're not striving to be, then what the fuck are you doing it for anyway? Did you see the Kanye documentary? The Netflix no. doc? It's no. actually really good. It's really interesting to see how they documented him kind of like blowing up the process of it because you see the mindset and it's exactly that. It could be taken as arrogance by some people, but really if you don't innately have that, if you don't have that belief in yourself that something you're doing is just extraordinary, I don't know how you could really go after that dream in that way. You know, the, arrogant is what someone calls you when they don't have the balls to pursue something. <laughs> and they don't have the guts, right? Headline right here. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, I am arrogant, you know, but I am also very confident in my abilities. And I would challenge anybody to put another band up on the stage when Systems playing at their, their full ability and see who you think is better. You know, I already know the answer to that. So, yeah, I'm arrogant. But I'm arrogant because I've got the goods. Well, also, just objectively speaking, when you listen to System of a Down, you can't confuse it with any other band. It just doesn't sound like anything else. Being able to come out with something unique is hard. So did you recognize that at the time, that it's really unlike anything else that's out there? Because it really, your band ended up revolutionizing music at that time. In, in Initially, there were nuances that were more reminiscent of other bands but yeah as we continued we became more and more like a unicorn you know and that there really wasn't anybody else sounding like us doing what we were doing because you couldn't you couldn't replicate it because it comes from the inside right um since then though i've heard a bunch of different bands that are that are heavily influenced by system and i think that's the greatest compliment you know, that in our time we're still around and there's these other bands that are taking influence from you and maybe incorporating that into their sound and becoming something different, you know, on its own. That's Absolutely. an amazing compliment. Oh, it's an it's it's definitely a compliment and I hear it not only in rock music but in other genres as well. Even Serge's voice, you can't confuse with other vocalists. He's incredibly unique. Incredibly unique. Yeah. Um he has been compared with like uh, Jello Biafra and uh Mike Patton and just yeah. because they're also super unique in their own way, yeah. but maybe tonalities, they have some things in common. Do you feel misunderstood? By whom? Even the base that you've alienated by actually being truthful about your political uh, perspective. Well, I think I actually present a fairly balanced political view where one side isn't always right and the other side isn't always wrong. It's kind of like an amalgam of the two being right and wrong at the same time more often than not. And um, I've always been more of a centrist, but a little bit on the conservative side. For example, I never really liked how Vietnam veterans were treated when they came back from Vietnam. Although I didn't believe that was a just war. There are no just wars. There's no, e even if you look at um, World War II, and as much as we went and fought for what we consider to be the right, right, like against Nazi tyranny and against the killing of millions of people, there's nothing just about it because at the end of the day, people are dying that are innocent. Not everybody in Germany wanted to fight for the Nazis, you know, but they felt they were compelled to either because the propaganda got a hold of them or they were afraid for their lives. So there is no just. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm being misrepresented or it's just that people want to sensationalize things. And the fact of the matter is, we don't really do a lot in system to give people something to talk about. So the internal conflicts of the band are something that people gravitate towards. And even though I can have dinner with a band member of mine and have a debate and have differences of opinion, that's not the way it wants to be perceived. Now, as far as fans of ours that have been turned off by my opinions, I can say that many people were turned off by a lot of things other band members have had to say in the past. But the bottom line is that right now, the way of thinking is a very woke, pasteurized mentality that permeates society. And I just, I just can't subscribe to that, even if it's detrimental to my career in one way or the other. Yes, I've lost followers. I'm sorry that they feel compelled to leave if they have a difference of opinion with somebody. But I hate to break the news to you. You're probably going to have disagreements throughout your life, and that doesn't mean you're going to destroy relationships that you have. So you're not going to quit a job. 
You know, you're not going to break up with somebody. You're not going to stop being friends with your family or friends. You know, you're going to have issues with people. But if, but if you've been propped up to think that anybody that disagrees with you is a bad person, which has been done quite a bit lately, then I can understand why a lot of these very young, very impressionable people feel the way they do. But that won't detract from my inability to stray away from mm. what I find to be the truth. That's exactly what my question stemmed from, because people are being demonized for having dissenting opinions, when in reality, it should be that we should be able to debate, argue, disagree, do it respectfully without insulting each other. But if you don't subscribe to any one ideology now, you're automatically demonized as a bad person. And then the it goes both ways, too, by the way, like even... If you're not conservative enough or if you're not liberal enough, then you're looked at as somebody that has no use or place. And, you know, it's a civil war of thought that we're experiencing right now. And I don't think there's a victor. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I just think that right now, one side is definitely being attacked more than the other. Yeah, whereas maybe five, ten maybe, years ago, it was maybe, the other way around. But it's already starting to switch. Because a lot of the things that people were led to believe, now they're finding out that they weren't true. Mm -hmm. You know, the veil is being lifted and and some people will not be able to come to terms with that, mm -hmm. that they've been bamboozled, you know, but we all experience these things. It happens to the smartest of us and the dumbest of us alike, you know, and um, you're not going to go through life without having been misled by somebody for whatever mm -hmm political or financial gain that they have in mind. And it's okay to be wrong. It's okay to be wrong. You'll be wrong often in life, you know, and the more open you are to the fact that you might be wrong, feel free to prove me wrong anytime. I'll change my opinion like this. Exactly, exactly. I'm stuck to nothing. No ideology, no religion, no philosophy. I'm stuck to nothing. I'm open to everything. When there are these headlines that try to paint you out to be some completely something else, do you feel the need to counter those headlines somehow or do you just leave it alone? You, you might want get that inclination, right? Like you want to defend yourself. But once you get into the defense mode, you've already lost the battle. Yeah. You just have to stay steadfast, let people judge for themselves. Not everybody listens to everything that they're told. People will read between the lines, but, you know, let's, let's look at, for example, Instagram. You know, I've hovered around 250,000 followers for probably like three or four years. Um, when we were in the middle of the Trump versus Biden debacle and, and you know, attempting to figure out who was going to continue to lead this country... I lost a ton of followers every time I would post something that was either pro-Trump or po pro my opinions one way or the other. You know, it wasn't always that I agreed with Trump, but I agreed with the philosophy of making the United States our first priority, making sure that our citizens were our first priority, which is what pretty much every country, household, when you break it down to a household level, that's what you're concerned with the most, right? Of course, you don't want to hurt your neighbors. You want everybody to succeed and prosper. But at the end of the day, if you're not focused on your home, you're not going to be able to help anybody else anyway. And, um, you know, I would post something and I would instantly lose 1,000, 2,000 people. Um, I've probably blocked 5,000 people. And, uh, For you negative know, feedback? If they're, if they're out of line. Okay. Right? Like, I'm, I don't mind somebody disagreeing with me. I like that, actually. Because sometimes you'll get uh, an opinion that will help you to reform yours, you know, give you a different perspective. So th that's never been the issue, as long as it was done in a respectful manner. I try not to be disrespectful, so I won't accept somebody that's being disrespectful. So a lot of people are afraid of alienating fans. You obviously are not because you lose those 1,000 and 2,000 followers and then you still continue posting anyway. Well, I figured like I'll just keep posting until I have zero. <laughs> you know, and then we could just start from scratch. Uh huh. No, that's never been a concern for me. You know, um, I appreciate the fans. They are the reason that we have a nice house and that we, we can afford a car and I can pay for my kids' school and pay for their meals and everything. It's directly because these people spent their hard on earned money on my band, you know, and have supported us through the years and been there for us. But I don't feel a responsibility to them 
as far as having to have a certain opinion, because if I did, it would be impossible to please everybody, right? So you have a segment of your fans that agree with you, and then there's a segment of your fans that disagree. It's physically impossible to please everybody. My father is in his late 70s now, and I know that the reality is he's not going to be around forever, you know, and, and we were at the house the other day, and I said, Dad, you know, you haven't done it in years. You have all the grandkids here. Why don't you go get your saxophone and, and play for us? No, I haven't played in three years, and my dad's a ham. He loves the attention, you know. <laughs> so he was convinced to go get a saxophone, and he played it, and I have video of my daughters having fun and dancing around, and my niece and nephew and doing the same and everything. And I was just like, you know, that's going to be me one day, you know, if I'm lucky enough to see it. You know, my kids are going to have kids. And if I'm lucky and I'm still alive, maybe one day they'll say, you know, Grandpa, you haven't played drums in a couple of years. Why don't you play Toxicity for us, you know? It, it's just interesting because life bookends, you know, it always does. And um, I don't know, I, I, stuff like that moves me. You know, stuff like that is meaningful to me. Those are the things that also people don't see, right? When you're talking earlier about um, people making judgments about me because I have one philosophy or another, or maybe I don't agree with them at their, you know, 20-year-old mind and the way they think, because let's face it, they lack the wisdom to think the way I think in a lot of ways, right? Maybe one day they'll get there. Some people that are my age still don't get it, but whatever. But they don't see that stuff, you know? And... And I guess maybe it's not important for them to see it because they, they don't really know me and I don't know them. And why, why do they matter as far as the way I operate my life? They don't at the end of the day. That's the worst part of social media is that people sit there and they think all these people's opinions of you mean anything. <laughs> and they mean nothing. So whether or not System of a Down is uh, working together, your uh, recognizable face are you using that toward any other business ventures right now? I do have different business ventures. Some of them are artistic in nature. For example, my uh, comic book company, I look at that as an art artistic venture, even though we have 50 employees now and it's a lot of work and all this stuff. I try to focus mainly on the creative aspect of it. And then I put up my own comic book, which you know about. We talked about it last time. Did you ever read it? No. What a jerk. I know. Did, you, did I give it to you? No. Well, what a the, jerk. Then I'm the jerk. Okay, I'll get you, I'll get you on. I actually put on trade paperback too. Okay. And I'm working, uh, I'm working towards making that into a, a TV series or a movie or something like that, which we kind of uh, touched on last time. Yeah. Um, so hopefully that'll happen, you know. But I'm so doing what stage are you in with trying to make it into a movie or a TV well, show? Well, first I have to get past the council culture that happened to yeah. me. Yeah. which is starting to subside. People are coming back to their senses. So does that mean you're looking for a new agent to shop the project? I actually ran into the agent that owns the agency, that used to be an agent, that owns the agency, or is one of the top guys. And I told him, hey, he's like, oh, I haven't seen you in a while. Let's talk about the project. And I go, you guys told me you didn't want to do it. You know, He, he didn't even know about it. So I think that maybe we'll get back in. But, I mean, I'm a little apprehensive working with people that that are a part of cancel culture, because mm -hmm. I feel like you don't deserve an opportunity to work with somebody that you canceled, you know? But then again, my soft part of me, the soft-hearted nature that I have, is like everybody makes mistakes, everybody gets in a situation where they're afraid for their livelihood, and there's a broader picture that you have to think about, and you know, not everybody has the freedoms you have to make the decisions you make, right? Which is why, you know, I guess it's so important for me to make honest moves and decisions um, because I'm capable of doing it, you know, which is also why I should have five kids. <laughs> okay, so back to the blueprint of like trying to figure out for somebody who really, really wants to be successful at what they do, the passion, it's there, but like, what are the moves that you make? Would you, like, let's say Maya came up to you and said, um, Dad, I want to be a professional drummer and I want to be in a Grammy award-winning band just like you, what would you tell her? Well, first of all, you're going about it completely wrong. You don't say, I want to be in a, complete, in a successful band and win a Grammy. You say, I want to create music and be a part of a band that I believe in 
and that I love what I'm doing. Okay, so here's the reason why I phrased it the way that I did. Okay. Because most shows that talk about journeys to success or anything like that, that's exactly what they focus on. Oh, you have to be motivated by the right things. That's our that's why I said that like the passion's already there. Let's that's a given. But, but art, no. art is completely different than everything else. Mhm. Mm you know, it's only recently like the last 60 or 70 years in human history has art really been acknowledged financially the way it has been right before that you didn't make dick being an artist right right if you're an actor you didn't make any money you could barely you could barely have a living but you did it because you loved it if you're a musician let's face it <laughs> you you may not have even been given much respect now i'm not talking about like mozart beethoven that's different but i'm talking about the the people that that spent decades mastering their craft it just wasn't really given the importance that we do now right like recently more recently yeah there's the financial and the same thing in, in athletics you used to have the olympics for pride right it was a matter of pride in greece you the different cities would send their uh, people to compete and you went back if you won you were victorious you did if you represented your city now you can make you know 50 million dollars as a quarterback in the nfl it's a different paradigm you know? yeah and i mean even the time you came up and now for musicians the road is very different uh even some of the platforms that are available for musicians now the access have, is better yeah it's democratized the field a little yes bit. it's harder to make a living at it because of that access and everybody everybody is so used to getting things for free right and they're almost insulted if you charge them for something well how the hell does somebody make a living yeah they got to be able to make the music for you. They can't do that if they're working four jobs. Yeah. I, mean, I did. But again, that's exactly why I Maybe phrased... Maybe you can. <laughs> that's exactly why I phrased my question the way that I did. Because artists always talk about the passion you have to have and uh, the motivation has to come from the right place. Absolutely. You know? Can I, but can I break I, it down for you? Mm -hmm. They're all full of shit. That's what I'm there trying to no say. There is no advice you can give anybody to get them to be successful. I don't think that's true. There is no path to success except for the one that you make. Everyone is unique. Even that in itself is That's a path. That's not advice. I mean, I worked very hard. Not every member of my band worked as hard as me. You know, um, certain members of my band never even had a job in their lives. But I, I worked from three in the morning until five at night at Pepsi Cola. And then I went in my Pepsi Cola shirt with my name John on here. And I went to um, sound check. You know, that was my path. And then when I had a lunch break, I would go home and practice. You know, that's how I got there. But everybody's path is different. And no, it's but not you're... like I could say, if you do this, this, and this, you'll be successful. No. If you do this, this, and this, you get extremely lucky. You get the right group of people and you create something that's special, then you have a chance at success. Of you have course. to do all that to have the chance. Yes. There's no... But what do you do to have the chance? Because you could be sitting on a pile of gold, but it has to be seen. Like it has well, you have to... to dig for it, don't you? That's too philosophical. But, it, but it's 100% right. If, if I'm sitting on a piece of land and there's gold underground and I never think to dig, am I ever going to be rich? Uh, let me stray from the philosophy and just get to like a more practical... Like, you want to be pragmatic right now? Yes. Okay. What I'm trying to say is like, for example, now something that we have, up-and-coming artists, they have access to music producers and music production companies from like Instagram. And, for, and artists are actually getting discovered that way just by messaging people. It's a and lot saying, easier hey, to get discovered. Yeah. Yes. But I think that these are important moves that you have to make in order to, um, in, order, in order to have access to someone that could give you wider distribution. But you have to understand content, that I don't know right? anything about that because when we got signed, we had to go play at the Whiskey, the Roxy, and all these places. Mm -hmm. And we had to convince our friends to come see us play yeah. so that there'd be more than five people in the audience, right? Yeah. And then they had to tell people about it if they liked us. And that was it. Now, I don't know what we would do. Maybe we would just play in a garage and, and post it on Instagram. But then how does it go from friends and family members coming to support you, them telling, okay, one or two friends that yes. this is a really awesome band, let's go, it'll be fun, to a record label signing you? Okay, so the way it went for us is that we started playing shows, 
This is even before I was in the band. The first show was Friends and Family. The second show may have been Friends and Family, but the friends bought different friends. And then slowly but surely, it grew. And then eventually, if you start to sell three or 400 tickets for a local band, people find out about it. Because all of these venues that you're playing, the Roski, the Roxy, the Whiskey, the Troubadour, all these venues, they have A&R people that come to these venues to see sign bands and other bands, you know, the bands they're pursuing and all that, and they talk. Oh, have you heard of anybody? Well, there's this band, System of a Down, you should check them out. Really? Who are they? Now you can just go on Instagram, oh, there's System of a Down. Back then, you had to find a way to find a tape, the demo tape, or find a flyer of the next time they're playing, get motivated as an A&R person to get off your ass that day and go to the show, and then maybe you don't, you're not into that music, right? Because mm. System certainly in the beginning was not for everybody. Today it's not for everybody. You know, so so many things have to happen in order to get to that point. I mean, you're you're kind of asking me to say, okay, what's the path? No, you answered my question but already. But really, the path is it's a massive room of dominoes. For sure. And every one of those dominoes has to fall right. If I pull one of those dominoes out, it doesn't happen. Yeah. Let's say, in in uh, in two thousand, or no, not two thousand. In nineteen ninety seven, I joined System of a Down, right? Or ninety six, whenever it was. Let's say I got my wife or my girlfriend pregnant at the time. Would I still be in System of a Down? If I had to support a kid? If that domino was taken out? Yeah, for there sure. There was no System of a Down for me. Yeah. And then if I'm not in the band and they get somebody else, will that person be able to help keep the band together? Will, will it sound the same? You get what I, And that's just me. There's yeah, that's four of life. Us. Yeah, that's life in general. But that's, for but sure. that's it, right? So all the dominoes have to fall right in order to become mm -hmm. successful. But if I, you ask me, if what would I say to my daughter? Now I'd say this: I'd say I love you. Whatever you do in your life, w with the exception of a couple of things that I will not allow you to do, we don't have to get into what those things are. But whatever you do in your life, do it because you love doing it, and that's it. And if you love doing it, you and you need to make sure you can make some kind of living at it, okay? But if you love doing it, you can never you can never fail, because you love what you do every day. You know, if you get up every day and you and you're and you're toiling through a job you hate, you have a miserable life. Let's say you get up every day, you do something you love, and you make a little bit of money, and you can eat and you can enjoy your life. Somebody else is doing something they hate, making a lot of money. Who's got the better life? That person's got a bigger house, but they don't have the better life. This person has the better life. So if you can find a way to merge those things, I mean, do it, you know? But it's hard. But let me set it best. Somebody's got to make it. And there's a next generation, and somebody's got to make it. But what that path is, you have to discover that for yourself. Being in the position that you're in, you interact with a lot of people. I'm sure that you've met the Kardashians. I think Dan Bolzerian is a friend of yours. You guys played poker together, right? I don't remember meeting the Kardashians, but Dan, no? Dan's a friend oh. of mine. Okay. So do you ever think strategically like, well, if we combine forces, maybe we can, we can do something interesting for Armenia. Or is that just not where your mind is? I don't really like to pressure people to do things that they don't want to do or that they don't think of naturally. Um, I want everybody to do things for the right reasons. At the end of the day, if you can't come up with the right reasons yourself, you shouldn't be involved. Uh, I would like the Kardashians to discontinue making products in Turkey and helping an economy that hurts Armenians. You know, um, make it in Armenia. You know, we have textiles. We have the ability to produce things. I think Zara just started uh, producing some of its clothes in Armenia, right? Great. Yeah. So, you know, I don't know. Everybody can do their part. You know, buy, uh, buy Armenian products as much as you can. Um, but we have to work on our infrastructure, and we really have to stop sending everybody that has half a brain out of Armenia to pursue you know, financial reasons because the opportunities just don't exist there.
You know, people have to feed their families. If they're going to do it in Russia or Ukraine or France or anywhere else, that's where they're going to go. You know, but, you know, we have our home and we need to invest in that home and we need to repopulate it. What are what, three million people? If we're lucky in Armenia? Maybe less. Yeah. yeah. That's not a whole lot. And I'd say probably a third of those are elderly, you know, so... If we want a country to, to have in, in 100 years, got to have more kids. What are you most proud of in your career? Oh, that's a tough question. For a long time, it was the fact that we were nominated for Grammys and lost them. And because Led Zeppelin also was nominated for Grammys and never won one. So I was proud of that. I don't know. There's been so many incredible moments I guess it, it, if you're forcing me to pick one, it would be that we played in Armenia. And that while we were driving to the venue, all our soldiers were in line during the route of where we were driving and they were all suited, saluting us. And I think that there wasn't a moment that I've ever experienced that gave me the chills the way that one did.